To really know what makes a great city work, you have to peel back its skin and expose its secret life force. A system of incredible complexity and technology that millions depend on but few understand. A fantastic voyage now begins, a journey deep inside the world's mega cities. It's the world's biggest city. It covers more than 1,400 square kilometers. Its population density is greater than New York City, Tokyo, or London. But for the nearly 18 million people who live here, it's not just another metropolis. Mexico City is ground zero. On one side, one of the world's most earthquake-prone hotspots. On another, one of the world's most active volcanoes. And beneath their feet, the shaky foundation of an ancient lake bed. For Mother Nature, Mexico City is one big target. At any moment, the big one could hit. From the instant the alarm sounds, they have just 60 seconds to reach safety. Ahorita son simulacros. Cuando sea verdad, nos vamos a repetir, jóvenes. Por favor, tomen su papel en serio. For the children of Mexico City, this drill may seem like fun and games. But for the adults, it's deadly serious. In 1985, they lived through the real thing. The threat lies off the coast of Acapulco, beneath the placid Pacific. Anywhere along this shoreline, a quake could originate. Here, the Cocos and Rivera tectonic plates are forcing their way beneath a North American plate. The most feared section is the dreaded Guerrero Gap. For nearly a century, the pressure has been building. The Guerrero Gap lies 300 kilometers from Mexico City. But for a people devastated by a quake just two decades ago, it's too close for comfort. Unfortunately, this is closer to Mexico City than the 1985 earthquake, and we expect it could generate a huge disaster in the city. Dr. Juan Manuel Espinoza manages Mexico City's Seismic Alert System, or SAS. He spent his life developing technology to detect the next big quake. This is what pushed for the development of the electroseismic system. It's what justifies the development of this system. Today, along the Pacific coast, Mexico City is guarded by the first system of its kind. Twelve seismic sensors to detect earthquake tremors. These are the city's high-tech prophets of doom. The system of alert seismic the seismic alert system covers the region where there could be an earthquake with equipment like this, where we have seismic sensors that continuously listen to the sound of the ground and analyze it. They listen for vibrations and measure their strength. The force of any earthquake is measured on the Richter scale. Most people know it by name. Few understand its diabolical mathematics. Though the scale theoretically has no limit, every quake ever measured has fallen between 0 and 9.5. But a single decimal point 
can mean a giant increase in destruction. Each additional 0.1 means 100% more force. In Mexico City, a quake above 7.5 can destroy buildings. The 1985 quake that devastated Mexico City, 8.0. Beyond 8.5, ruin. When a quake registers at least 6.0, it activates a seismic monitoring station. When at least two stations are activated, they relay a signal to Mexico City, automatically triggering an alarm. In Mexico City, distance equals time. The city's salvation lies in grade school algebra, and it's already worked. September the 14th, 1995, 8.04 a.m. From the Pacific, a fierce quake thunders ashore. In 13 seconds, it registers on station 11. Four seconds later, on station 12. The quake measures 7.3 on the Richter scale, and it's moving toward Mexico City at 12 times the speed of the world's fastest commercial jet. But the SAS alert beats the quake to the city by 72 seconds. Not one resident is killed. When the alarm sounds, a carefully choreographed movement begins. Buildings empty, subways shut down, to avoid fires, power is cut and gas lines are closed. Rescue workers scramble. But Mexico City's entire civil defense depends on the thin red line of sentinels, the earthquake sensors on the coast. If they fail, a quake will hit with no warning at all. To prevent failures, the sensors are routinely inspected. Today, it's a sensor at the San Pedro station near Acapulco. For Roberto Islas, just getting there is shaky. To come here to the stations, with all the difficulties it entails, to perform maintenance, we're motivated because we know our job is important, not only for us, but for every person who lives in Mexico City. And that if an earthquake occurs, we may save many lives. The equipment is so delicate, it needs shielding from the subtropical sun, and Roberto must work fast. The routine maintenance is done every two months, so every two months we come to look at each one of the parameters of the sensor equipment and the modifications in the tower. We measure the voltage parameters with the multimeter we have here with us. The sensor passes the inspection. The electronic lookout faithfully mans its post. In the never-ending war with Mother Nature, Mexico City remains on the defensive. Ever alert. Never knowing when it will be forced to relive a nightmare. The day the earth shook. Most great cities are founded on rivers. Mexico City was founded on prophecy. On a swampy island, Aztec legend says, an omen appeared. An eagle perched on a cactus eating a snake. An omen to build. The Aztecs built Tenochtitlan, the city of dreams. Through the centuries, it survived Mother Nature's worst torments. Then, from across the sea, came a man-made disaster. Spanish conquistadors destroyed the city of dreams and built a new city in its place. Centuries later, disaster still arrives from the sea, 
the epicenter of Mexico City's biggest quakes. Está temblando, está temblando un poquitito. No se asusten, vamos a quedarnos. Les doy la hora. September the 19th, 1985. Just after 7 a.m. The city awakes to shattering news. Sigue temblando un poquitito, pero pues vamos a tomarlo con una gran tranquilidad. Vamos a esperar un segundo para poder hablar. broadcast is cut off and the television studio collapses. Miraculously, the reporters survive. I was getting dressed with my first worry, because all the TV stations were off the air, was to see what had happened at my workplace. Jacobo Zabludovsky is Mexico's most revered journalist. But on the blackest day in the city's history, he was also an eyewitness. This is Televicentro Televisa. The only building left standing was that one, six floors. All this area had theaters, TV studios, archives. It was all destroyed. I was director of the news shows at Televisa. I knew who was there at 7.19 in the morning in the building that collapsed. Seven floors fell one on top of another like a sandwich. I knew the people who died there. I gave them their jobs. They were my colleagues. Eran mis compañeros. En este lugar murieron In this place, personas. more than 100 people died. We'll never know the exact number. Amid his grief, the journalist went back to work. Y ahora, señoras y señores, estoy en From his car phone. Zabludovsky reported the quake's toll. For the millions without electricity, Battery-powered radio was the only way to get news. Tengo la tristeza de decir que estoy en presencia de uno de los más grandes desastres que he visto en la historia de la Ciudad de México desde que nací en ella. The grief of an entire city found a voice. Estoy mirando hacia el sur la Avenida San Juan de Letrán y es el aspecto de un desastre como si hubiera caído una bomba. While one man chronicled the disaster, another struggled to survive it. I remember it very well. This hit that corner from over there. It destroyed all that level. It destroyed all the floors. And I fell. I fell over here. Here. I stood here, buried under rubble. Pedro Ferriz de Con lived to become the most popular radio host in the nation. But in 1985, he was just another victim of bad engineering. I believe many of the buildings that collapsed did so because of corruption. In this country, there were regulations for construction. It's true, the authorities monitor the plans, but the materials used were not up to the proper standards. Fewer materials were used, less steel was used, a lower quality of concrete was used. The result was, many buildings that from my point of view were not supposed to fall, actually did. Even the most important buildings weren't constructed to withstand the shock waves. A few blocks over there, there's the National Hospital of Mexico. It fell. 
Hospitals, churches, stadiums, and public spaces should be built differently. They can't collapse. Well, it fell completely. There were kids, babies, who were under the debris for 15 days, without water, without food. And they took them out alive over there, alive. These are miracles that are walking in the streets of Mexico City today. As a matter of fact, I was a miracle too. I thought I was going to die. The con survived a seismic truth. Earthquakes don't kill people. Buildings do. In all, 412 buildings were leveled. Thousands more were damaged beyond repair. No one knows exactly how many people perished inside. Some say 10,000. Estimates go as high as 30,000. What made the damage so great is the very ground the city is built on. One thing is certain, the underground of Mexico City varies substantially. Dr. Sri Krishna Singh is head of the Seismological Institute at the University of Mexico. In this general area, where we are right now on the university campus, there's no danger of quakes because this is volcanic subsoil. It's very sturdy subsoil. However, the lake area is a very vulnerable part of the city. The heart of the city is built on landfill over an ancient lake bed. What was meant as a stable foundation became a seismic amplifier. Seismic waves travel from the epicenter of an earthquake like ripples in a pond, losing strength with distance. But not here. In this porous, water-saturated soil, seismic waves are magnified 5 to 20 times. In a process called liquefaction, the seismic waves turn the subsoil to jelly. Buildings topple beneath their own weight. Amplification here is so notorious, the world scientists have a nickname for this seismic horror. The Mexico City Effect. In the quest to make Mexico City earthquake-proof, the shifting earth poses a challenge to every construction project, whether above ground or below. Mexico City has the world's third busiest subway system, behind only Moscow and Tokyo. 176 stations, 207 kilometers of track, more than 4 million riders a day. But most impressive is the system's conquest of the terrain. When we began to build the subway, we discovered that the soil was very muddy. So construction was very difficult. The answer was a construction technique called Milan walls. Two parallel trenches are dug, then filled with concrete and steel rods to form the subway tunnel's walls. Between these walls, the tunnel itself is dug. But engineers ran into an obstacle, a law of buoyancy called Archimedes' principle. The same principle that allows a submarine to rise, dive or float. The tunnel had to weigh the same as the earth that was excavated. Weigh less and it would rise. More and it would sink. Instead, the tunnel had to float in the soil. To ensure equilibrium, engineers precisely calibrated the weight of the walls to match the displaced soil. Over the open stations, they made up the difference by putting up buildings. No one knew if the Milan walls would withstand an earthquake. Then came 1985. The quake leveled the Juarez hospital. The subway station below, not a scratch. The entire system rode out the seismic waves by floating in the subsoil. In fact, the subway was the only way to reach many disaster zones. 
Yet, even as the subway tunnels advance, the greatest feat of engineering is happening on the surface. While the city sleeps, work continues on one of the biggest projects in its history. The Segundo Piso, or second floor. 12 kilometers long when complete, it's built directly above the Periferical, the traffic-clogged freeway that rings the city. The Segundo Piso is built not only to withstand a quake like 1985, it's built partly because of it. People fled the city for the suburbs, seeking a safer place to build. And the city started expanding, creating many problems, because as more people travel, you have more traffic problems, more pollution. The 1985 quake shocked the city. Claudia Scheinbaum is the project director. The goal is to provide a road to the western part of the city and particularly to divide the drivers with long trips so they can go on the higher level from the drivers with short trips so they can go on the lower level. Scheinbaum's challenge? Unclog the congested highways without creating a death trap. The solution? Tame the unstable terrain. The Segundo Piso will be supported by 179 pillars in a ring around the city. On average, each stands 16 meters and weighs 100 tons. Erecting each one is an engineering challenge in itself. First, the subsoil must be analyzed. Every site in Mexico City is different and each foundation must be sunk deep enough to withstand seismic waves. Then the column is poured erected and locked to its subterranean foundation. Then the piece that locks the column with the concrete foundation is fixed with an engineering process called tensing. So you use cables to pull it, a force that keeps them tense for 50, 60, 70, many years. After the columns comes an arm. There are around 400 that we have to mount during the night. And after that come the road beds. Around 2,200 road beds in the whole segundo piso. Each of these pieces, for example the one to be mounted today, weighs about 200 tons. We even mounted pieces we call whales that weigh around 320 to 340 tons. The columns support the arms, and the arms further support the roadbeds. For any engineer, a project like this is a mountain of hurdles, but Scheinbaum must leap a hurdle few others face. Her work has to withstand an earthquake. The Segundo Piso can take an earthquake much stronger than the 1985 one, almost one and a half times stronger. That's how it's been calculated, but it can probably take even more than that. There has to be strict quality control during the entire construction process. That's very important. Because you can design very well, but you can build very badly. It's an all too common story. Earthquakes and elevated roads just don't mix. This is what happened with many bridges that have fallen. They didn't have the best pieces in a certain place. In 1989, an earthquake hit San Francisco during rush hour and collapsed sections of the Bay Bridge and Nimitz Freeway. In all, 63 people perished. Mexico City has learned from others' mistakes. Instead of resisting the quake, it will move with it. What's important is that the structure moves all together, that there are no moments in which one part moves like this and another moves like this. Because those are the moments when it breaks. It's designed so it moves together. So, if you're on the Segundo Piso at the time of a quake, you'll get dizzy because it's going to move.
the scope of the entire project is dizzy. On the Segundo Piso, progress is measured one giant piece at a time. I hope it fits. A perfect fit. Now only 399 more to go. The Segundo Piso is a sign of a city in recovery. To rebuild after the disaster of 1985, Mexico City had to overcome its jitters and conquer its fear of heights in spite of the towering risk. If defiance were a building, it might look like this. This is the Torre Mayor, the biggest tower. At 55 stories, it's the tallest skyscraper in Latin America. President Vicente Fox calls it the symbol of a new Mexico. And it is. Two decades after the disastrous earthquake of 1985, Mexico City is no longer afraid to reach for the sky. Just after the quake, the regulations in the city changed. Some regulations were approved that stated we could build only up to four floors. This fear disappeared not only with time, but also with the idea that in a city like this one, we have the best specialists, excellent designers who are able to transform all this fear into a new challenge, to move on from the ruins of a quake like 1985 to build a new Mexico, to build new buildings and to reach for the sky like any other metropolis in the world. And reach, they did. Architect Arturo Espuro knows the Torre Mayor like his own home, all 77,000 square meters. Torre Mayor is, without a doubt, one of the safest buildings in Latin America. It's made of concrete, steel, and data. The analysis of earthquake damage to buildings around the world. The result, a skyscraper safeguarded by some of the most sophisticated earthquake-proof technology ever used. It begins with the architectural equivalent of shock absorbers. The steel structure of this huge tower, these double columns that we can see, go up to the top of the building. We can also see some of the diagonals. The role of these absorbers, 98 of them, in the whole steel structure of the tower is to always keep the building vertical. Torre Mayor is the first building in Latin America that has these huge seismic shock absorbers. They're built right into its frame. During a quake, a conventional building may sway precariously from side to side, but the Torre Mayor is far from conventional. Instead, it can flex in three dimensions. Attached to its cross beams are 98 resilient dampers that absorb the brunt of a quake. Flexible up top, the tower is firmly anchored down below. It rests on 251 concrete pilings, driven 60 meters deep below the marshy landfill and into firmer subsoil. In theory, the building can withstand an 8.5 magnitude quake, a force that would topple nearly any other building its size. It all sounds good in theory, and this theory has actually been tested. In 2003, a quake measuring 7.6 on the Richter scale struck Mexico City. A lot of people in the building, especially those who didn't have any hanging lamps to see any movement, realized something was happening when they looked out the window and saw people evacuating the neighboring buildings. 
Algunas de las anécdotas que nuestros propios inquilinos contaban después de ese... Some of our tenants said they didn't even feel any shake. Que no sintieron la oscilación. That proves the shock absorbers reduce the shaking of the building and make it almost imperceptible. La oscilación del edificio que llega a ser incluso imperceptible para muchas gentes aquí. Earthquakes kill in two ways. When buildings collapse or when people panic. The Torre Mayor is designed to prevent both. The Torre Mayor is the only building in Mexico that gets electricity from three different parts of the city. If we lack electricity in one of them, these switches send all of our system to the second substation. If there is no electricity in that second substation, it switches to feed from the third one. So we don't lose electricity at any point in Torre Mayor. Lo que nos permite eso es que no se vaya la luz en Torre Mayor. La gente no entra en pánico. The people here don't panic because lights don't go off at any point. This helps us evacuate the tenants in a safe and orderly fashion. When a quake hits, chances are scores of people will be riding the elevators. But in the Torre Mayor, nothing is left to chance. These elevators move at a third of a kilometer per minute. To really appreciate their speed, you need the right perspective. The most important characteristic of these elevators is their speed. The 20 passenger elevators of Torre Mayor move at six meters per second, exactly what we're seeing now that we're on top of a cabin. And this is the speed with which our employees get to their offices. This way, we can move approximately 8,000 employees, and at this speed, they will be able to move continuously. Besides speed, these elevators also have computer-controlled brakes to prevent people being stuck between floors during an earthquake. That's why the elevator system contains in its base, in the elevator pit, a seismic sensor that detects any earth movement and then automatically stops the elevator at the closest floor so the passengers can get off. But imagine the worst. Exits blocked below and people trapped up high. No problem. The Torre Mayor has a built-in escape hatch. Ya, ya terminó la operación. Hay que avisarle a todos los muchachos para que terminen en coches la maniobra de seguridad. In Mexico City, a skyscraper built to save lives is a revolution in design, made possible only by a revolution in culture and construction standards. The Torre Mayor broke many stereotypes. For instance, during the construction phase of a skyscraper, there was a tradition that somebody had to lose his life. There was a table that said, as a rule, one life was lost for every ten floors. Nobody lost his life during the construction of Torre Mayor, and nobody has lost his life up to today, precisely because we comply with a new culture, with a different Mexico. The Torre Mayor towers over Mexico City, a landmark of stability. In the distance, towers another landmark, a far more ominous reminder of the city's treacherous foundation. And like the specter of rumbling earth, it casts a fearful shadow. Mexicans call it El Popo, shorthand for its Aztec name, Popocatapetl, the smoking mountain. It's still smoking. The same forces that trigger the region's earthquakes, the clash of tectonic plates, form and fuel El Popo. It's one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Downtown Mexico City lies nearly 60 kilometers from El Popo, but even in the heart of the city, a walk in the park 
takes you into harm's way. This is part of an eruption, and it's a lava flow. People don't consider these volcanoes a threat to the city, and that it could put them in danger. But really, it's quite the opposite. Dr. Carlos Valdez Gonzalez is an expert on earthquakes and volcanology at the Seismological Institute. The reality is that half of Mexico City is sitting on a lava deposit that came from different volcanoes. Yet the same forces that can destroy the city gave it life. The richness of this soil has to do with the presence of volcanoes. The forests, the agricultural land, and also the reason why our ancestors settled here, all has to do with the presence of the volcanoes. If they weren't here, the soil wouldn't be as rich, nor the climate as pleasant, and Mexicans probably wouldn't have lived here. But they do live here, so they must be on guard. Just as the city deploys the tools of seismic science to detect earthquakes, it uses cutting-edge technology to monitor El Popo. There are a series of seismic sensors surrounding the volcano, with the goal of measuring any vibration that may happen and show its origin. Another monitoring option is to look at any deformation the volcano might have. If material starts coming up, initially the volcano will expand very minimally. So we have instruments, one of which is essential. It's a laser beam that goes up to a reflector inside the volcano, then comes back. If there is a very slight variation, such as a fraction of a millimeter in the growth of the volcano, those instruments can detect it. Sensors and lasers aren't the only weapons in his arsenal. Se toman muestras de ceniza, material que ha emitido el volcán, se analizan sobre el contenido. We analyze ashes or material that the volcano emits. These indicate future activity. Hay una serie de cámaras que vigilan al volcán las 24 horas. Hay la posibilidad de que en la noche la cámara es sensible a la luz y podemos. We have a series of cameras that control the volcano 24 hours. These are cameras sensitive to light that work during the night, so we can detect if it's emitting ashes or vapors. And all these monitoring systems together transmit to Mexico City. We can know about the state of this volcano in real time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Since 1995, El Popo has been smoking, conjuring images of molten doom. But it needn't spew lava to wreak havoc. It doesn't have to be an eruption. Just an explosion of ash could threaten a city as large as Mexico City. When ash meets water, it hardens like concrete. It could grind the city to a halt. We could have some serious problems if the ash deposits on the soil and if we get that amount of ash in a rainy season. It could be drained by the rain and the result could be the ash clogs the drainage system. In the rainy season, backups could lead to city-wide flooding. And that's the least of their worries. In dry weather, even more infrastructure could be threatened. Since these are solid particles, ash won't allow radio waves to emit, which will prevent the air transmissions from working. So we would have problems with communication, problems of data transmission, and also, in general, all the machines that have electronic components will be affected by an ash layer, because it will penetrate them and deposit in them. We could also have problems transmitting electricity, and we could face blackouts. The threat is real. In June 1997, El Popo spewed so much ash, transportation was crippled. The city was even forced to close its airport. 
Growth has made Mexico City even more vulnerable to El Popo. As the city expands, it moves ever closer to the thin line between progress and peril. 50 years ago, this part of the city didn't exist. Most of the city was farms. They didn't depend on electricity, and the number of flights back then was much less. So it's important to understand that the activity we have in this country, both seismic and volcanic, hasn't changed. What has changed are the activities of civilization, man, and all the work we do that make us more vulnerable to these phenomena than before. This mega city has chosen to live in a dilemma. Volcanoes on one side, earthquakes on another. Its only defense is early detection. From El Popo to the Guerrero Gap, the city's lookouts keep watch. The moment danger strikes, its guardian angels will leap into action. The alarms will sound. But those in the greatest peril may not hear the warning. When the great earthquake of 1985 struck Mexico City, it toppled hundreds of buildings and left thousands uninhabitable. This is one of them. But someone still lives here. I came here in September of 1944. I was 14 years old. My mother brought me here from my village. My mother worked here and she rented a small room and today I am still here. Pilar Valderrama came through the 1985 quake in better shape than the building. The quake got us when we were walking down the stairs, but I never ran. When it shakes, I stop because it's much more dangerous if you start running. One of the neighbors who lived on the top floor, the stairs collapsed and he was smashed there. So I stay here, upstairs, and wait for the quake to end. The building was condemned, and still Pilar stayed. Since 1985, the water doesn't come up anymore. We pump it up here, and here we are. But look, even with my poverty, my problems, I'm happy here. As I say to my children, what else do we need? Green spaces, panoramic views? Why worry? These ruins embody the two gaps in Mexico City's line of defense against earthquakes. Many old buildings are still vulnerable to a big quake, and many residents still get earthquake warnings not by SAS, but by radio. If the radio's not on, they won't get a warning. Just the shakes. If I'm here outside, I feel if we have an earthquake because the water moves, the tub moves, but alarms, we don't hear any alarms. I put my faith in the Lord above, in God, who's the only one who moves us, who protects us. Not quite. When the next quake hits, Mexico City will fall back on one last line of defense. These are the Condors, a branch of the Federal District Special Forces. They serve as medevacs for every hospital in Mexico City. In an earthquake, they may be the only rescuers who can reach victims in time. The response is immediate. As soon as the alarm goes off, we stop whatever we're doing and immediately go to our choppers. A 60-year-old man suffered a stroke. Basically, he needed to be treated within 10 minutes.
Edgar Mukecho has served with the Condors for six years. For him, every flight is a dress rehearsal for the day a quake hits. Today, they put that training to use. It was very serious since he had a convulsion when we were in the air, and they had to treat him so he could survive the attack. A land ambulance would have taken 40 minutes, and the good thing about this is that we were able to save one more life. The patient got there alive and is in good hands. And everything worked as planned, as it was supposed to be. That was our mission. We're satisfied for today. Tomorrow, there could be more. And other days, there could be a different scenario or emergency. Today, they saved one life. Tomorrow, perhaps thousands. Like few other cities, Mexico City will always live in the shadow of disaster, threatened by not one natural peril, but two. The dreaded Guerrero Gap, the seismic time bomb, is still ticking. El Popo, the fiery mountain, is still smoking. The big one may still be coming. For those charged with safeguarding millions of lives, the motto remains eternal vigilance. They prepare for the worst and pray it never comes. But whenever it does, this time, things will be different. Mexico City will be forewarned and forearmed. know what makes a great city work, you have to peel back its skin and expose its secret life force. A system of incredible complexity and technology that millions depend on but few understand. A fantastic voyage now begins, a journey deep inside the world's mega cities. It's the world's biggest city. It covers more than 1,400 square kilometers. Its population density is greater than New York City, Tokyo, or London. But for the nearly 18 million people who live here, it's not just another metropolis. Mexico City is ground zero. On one side, one of the world's most earthquake-prone hotspots. On another, one of the world's most active volcanoes. And beneath their feet, the shaky foundation of an ancient lake bed. For Mother Nature, Mexico City is one big target. And any moment, the big one could hit. From the instant the alarm sounds, they have just 60 seconds to reach safety. For the children of Mexico City, this drill may seem like fun and games. But for the adults, it's deadly serious. In 1985, they lived through the real thing. The threat lies off the coast of Acapulco, beneath the placid Pacific. Any 
anywhere along the shoreline a quake could originate. Here, the Cocos and Rivera tectonic plates are forcing their way beneath a North American plate. The most feared section is the dreaded Guerrero Gap. For nearly a century, the pressure has been building. The Guerrero Gap lies 300 kilometers from Mexico City, but for a people devastated by a quake just two decades ago, it's too close for comfort. Unfortunately, this is closer to Mexico City than the 1985 earthquake, and we expect it could generate a huge disaster in the city. Dr. Juan Manuel Espinoza manages Mexico City's Seismic Alert System, or SAS. He spent his life developing technology to detect the next big quake. This is what pushed for the development of the electroseismic system. It's what justifies the development of this system. Today, along the Pacific coast, Mexico City is guarded by the first system of its kind. Twelve seismic sensors to detect earthquake tremors. These are the city's high-tech prophets of doom. The seismic alert system covers the region where there could be an earthquake with equipment like this, where we have seismic sensors that continuously listen to the sound of the ground and analyze it. They listen for vibrations and measure their strength. The force of any earthquake is measured on the Richter scale. Most people know it by name. Few understand its diabolical mathematics. Though the scale theoretically has no limit, every quake ever measured has fallen between 0 and 9.5. But a single decimal point can mean a giant increase in destruction. Each additional 0.1 means 100% more force. In Mexico City, a quake above 7.5 can destroy buildings. The 1985 quake that devastated Mexico City, 8.0. Beyond 8.5, ruin. When a quake registers at least 6.0, it activates a seismic monitoring station. When at least two stations are activated, they relay a signal to Mexico City, automatically triggering an alarm. In Mexico City, distance equals time. The city's salvation lies in grade school algebra. And it's already worked. September the 14th, 1995. 8.04 a.m. From the Pacific, a fierce quake thunders ashore. In 13 seconds, it registers on station 11. Four seconds later, on station 12. The quake measures 7.3 on the Richter scale and it's moving toward Mexico City at 12 times the speed of the world's fastest commercial jet. But the SAS alert beats the quake to the city by 72 seconds. Not one resident is killed. When the alarm sounds, a carefully choreographed movement begins. Buildings empty, subways shut down. To avoid fires, power is cut, and gas lines are closed. Rescue workers scramble. But Mexico City's entire civil defense depends on the thin red line of sentinels, the earthquake sensors on the coast. If they fail, a quake will hit with no warning at all. To prevent failures, the sensors are routinely inspected. Today, it's a sensor at the San Pedro station near Acapulco. For Roberto Islas, just getting there is shaky. 
to come here to the stations with all the difficulties it entails to perform maintenance we are motivated because we know our job is important not only for us but for every person who lives in Mexico City and that if an earthquake occurs we may save many lives the equipment is so delicate it needs shielding from the subtropical sun and Roberto must work fast the routine maintenance is done every two months, so every two months we come to look at each one of the parameters of the sensor equipment and the modifications in the tower. We measure the voltage parameters with the multimeter we have here with us. The sensor passes the inspection. The electronic lookout faithfully mans its post. In the never-ending war with Mother Nature, Mexico City remains on the defensive, ever alert, never knowing when it will be forced to relive a nightmare. The day the Earth 